Welcome to Mill Valley. Welcome to the Mill Valley Public Library, and thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the board of the directors for the Mill Valley Historical Society. I'm co-in charge of the First Wednesday presentations tonight and the oral history program. So I am delighted to host this evening, in particular because it has to do with something that I love very much and I imagine many of you do as well, and that's the beautiful outdoors. Um, we, tonight's presentation is titled Of Martian Men Staying Above Water at Bothine Marsh. Before we go into the introduction, I'd like to say a little bit about tonight's, um, the, how things are going to go tonight. First of all, what's the first thing I always do when I come up here? I say thank you to the Mill Valley Public Library for allowing the Mill Valley Historical Society to host our first Wednesday presentations in this beautiful space. I particularly like downstairs because it just feels like we're in someone's really big living room and we're all cozy together. So I say thanks. And one of the ways we show our appreciation for the use of this space is to help put the chairs away at the end of the presentation. And we rely on your help to help us clean up the room. A little less for the library staff to do. Our presentation tonight is going to run about one hour. We're going to have about 15 minutes of Q&A. And um, then that'll be our time to interact with many individuals here from different land agencies. People from One Tam, uh, Marin Parks, the uh, stand up please so you, we can show you who's here. Because we don't just have our speaker, we have many people here representing the open spaces of Mill Valley and Marin County. And they're here at your service at the end of this presentation should you have questions about anything. Yeah. Uh, so, if you want to know where you're going, look at where you've been. And tonight, we're going to do just that, only with our eyes onto the natural surroundings, in particular, Bothine Marsh. So let's take a brief look back in time to understand the significance of tonight's presentation as it pertains to us and in the future. The San Francisco Bay f that we know today formed about 7,000 years ago, after the end of the last glacial maximus known as the Wisconsin era, that peaked at about 20,000 years ago. So our bay is relatively new when viewed from the geological perspective. The marshlands themselves evolved only after thousands of years of melt when the rise of ocean rested to something closer to what we know today. How long did it take the marshlands of our bay to evolve? thousands of years for plants and animals to negotiate that intimate relationship with their surroundings and to thrive. Thousands of years for the bay as we know it to form via this delicate dance of air, wind, and water. Which is why tonight's talk is so interesting and so important. Because human actions have accelerated environmental changes that have a major impact on us and other living things. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have with us Laurel Collins to describe these changes. For those who may not know, Bothine Marsh is the marsh that drains the Coyote Creek watershed in, in Tam Valley and includes the portion near Tam High. Laurel Collins is a fluvial geomorphologist with 40 years of experience studying western rivers, streams, and tidal marshes. When and where did Laurel's interest in geomorphology begin? I began right here, locally, sloshing in local mud puddles and saving pollywogs from drying out. 
As a child raised in Marin County, Laurel loved exploring local marshes and wetlands, and her explorations have continued throughout her adult life. However, now she looks at the natural world through the eyes of a scientist eager to understand how everything works. It was Veronica Pearson of Marin County Parks Project to study Bothine Marsh. It was Veronica who hired fluvial and tidal geomorphologist Laurel Collins from the Watershed Sciences, coastal ecologist and botanist consultant Peter Bays, and wetlands ecologist Josh Collins, who was with the San Francisco Estuary Institute, to help her with this research. Together, this group of puddle, of puddle jumpers spent two and a half years studying Bothine Marsh. Together, these three worked on a very large-scale project having to do with multiple facets of Bothine Marsh. Tonight, Laurel will be presenting just a small part of that report. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Laurel Collins. Thank you for the nice introduction. Can everybody hear me well enough? Okay, good. Um, well, I used to play in the creek when I was a kid. I grew up over in uh, Tiburon area and came to Mill Valley and wondered about creeks and now I get to study them so it's a, a wonderful thing to kind of come back full circle in a place that I actually did play in as a kid. Um, Deborah talked about marshes taking thousands of years. Can everybody see me? If am I better off for you over here? I'm gonna have to work my computer. Um, she mentioned that marshes take thousands of years to form and that's true, but man's activity can make marshes form actually in a much shorter period of time, and I'm going to demonstrate some of that this evening. So I'm going to start with, let's see how this works here. Okay, I'm going to start with the title of the report that I worked on with my colleagues, Peter Bay, who's a botanist, and Josh Collins, a wetlands ecologist. And together, we worked on many chapters of a report. And I'm just going to present one aspect of that report tonight about the historical conditions and changes and cause and effect. It's called Chapter 3, Environmental History. And I'll give you a link to a website where you can look at chapters 1, 2, and 3 if you're interested in finding out a lot more about tidal processes. Um, there'll be more to come having to do with I think input from the community and plans for what can be done, but we're in the... Okay. It's tricky. Is that a little better? Okay. It slides around. Um, so anyway, we're going to focus on the historical conditions. And a quick lesson in the location I think most of you probably know, but for those of you who aren't familiar, Here's a picture of the Golden Gate, part of the, the, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, not the whole area, Sausalito, Tiburon Peninsula. And we're going to focus on this little area between Strawberry Point and Tam Valley. It's where the Bothine Marsh Open Space Preserve exists, owned by Marin County or operated by Marin County. The boundary of our study area is in red. Highway 101, Richardson Bay Bridge. You can see the Bay Trail in black that dissects part of the marsh and runs through Sausalito and Mill Valley and other parts of the, the Bay Area. Shelter Cove uh, is across from Bothine Marsh. The Royal Corte Madera that drains in through Mill Valley. Part of the El Monte Marsh. Here's North Bothine Marsh next to El Monte Marsh. Manzino Marsh outside our study boundary, but to the south of Bothine Marsh. Coyote Creek Canal runs through, or alongside, I should say, and I'll make a point of saying that later on. Uh, it runs along the South Bothine Marsh, which is located right here in the center. State Route 1 also runs 
to the back side of South Bethune Marsh, also known as Shoreline Highway. Many of you travel along that road if you're going out to the coast. It was one of the first roads out to the coast. So let's look at this area from an aerial perspective. This is a 2017 photo. We're actually sitting in a little area where that circle is, the library in Mill Valley. And here's Richardson Bay, Richardson Bay Bridge, Pam Valley, and uh, Mill Valley. Now, how did we get from the past? This is an 1851 map that has some features on it that I want to point out. There's a, a dark brown line between the, the upland landscape and the tidal marsh landscape. Here's what we call historical Coyote Creek Marsh, El Monte Marsh, Manzanita Marsh. They're highlighted in green to help you see them. The creeks and some of the ponds were mapped at the time in 1851. If we project those marshes onto the present day landscape, this is where they would fit. But how did we get from the past to the present? This is our present landscape, El Monte Marsh, there's South Bethine Marsh, Tam Marsh, next to the Tam High School playfield, North Bethine Marsh, Rectangle Marsh, here's the Bay Trail, it's on a levee, Coyote Creek Canal. So how do we prepare for the future? Here's 2017, but here's 2100 with five and a half feet of projected sea level rise. This is from a, a website uh, called the Rising Tides, Adapting to Rising Tides. You can all look in the website on the internet and play with modeling sea level rise. So 2100. Before I get into cause and effect and how things changed, it's always important to give a little lesson in how marshes work. And so this is a little mini lesson in how marshes form and maintain themselves in the upper Richardson Bay. So if we take a broad landscape context in Richardson Bay, we have the, the hillsides and we have Mount Tam, which is the highest elevation of the area that affects the upper Richardson Bay that brings waters down to the San Francisco Bay. So the, the Bothing Marsh area is bounded by these two big features. San Francisco Bay brings water back and forth through the, the Golden Gate to the Gulf of the Fairlines. Here we have a Royal Cornamadera del Presidio in Mill Valley that brings waters to the, the Mill Valley marshes. And then the Coyote Creek watershed that brings waters down to the, the focus area of our study, the Bothine Marsh Complex. They bring water, upland water, down to the tidal marshes, and those bring it to the tidal flats, and then to Richardson Bay. Richardson Bay is essentially a sill. It's a flat area that drains over a shelf to the deeper water or deeper bay of the, the San Francisco Bay that has a dominant estuary and gradient out toward the Golden Gate. So if we look at a, a, bathymetric, uh, sorry, a bathymetric map of the Bay Area, we can see Upper Richardson Bay right in this area. The red areas represent very shallow water. And then the darker areas from green to blue represent very deep waters. If we look at this feature out here beyond the Golden Gate, it's sediment deposition that's happening along uh, the tides through the gate from sediments that come from all around the bay and even up from the Sierra. But Richardson Bay is a little bit different. It's not like a lot of the other marshes in the bay. If we look at this map, we can see the Golden Gate and we can see Richardson Bay, the light blue areas representing this shallow shelf that the bay is uh, formed on. And we can see the 10 meter or 32 foot contour line right at the edge of that shelf and then it gets very deep beyond that. Here's another perspective, Richardson Bay over there on the far left in gray. And then the deep blue colors are, and leading to purple are the, the deeper portions of the bay. So you see a little deep section off of the edge of the lower part of Richardson Bay, but everything beyond that is 
quite shallow. Navigational charts indicate that Richardson Bay is no deeper than 18 feet below mean lower low water. Upstream of the Richardson Bay Bridge, it is no deeper than a foot above mean lower low water. But right off the edge of the sill, it's more than 150 feet deep below million, mean lower low water. And most of the sediment supplied to upper Richardson Bay that has formed its upper marshes and mudflats is dominated by supply from local watersheds, not from sediment borne on the tides of the greater San Francisco Bay. So that means that a lot of that hydraulic sediment during the days of hydraulic mining did not necessarily go up and form the marshes at the head of Richardson Bay. Landscape context again. Let's look a little more deeply. Um, Coyote Creek and Arroyo del Corte Madera del Presidio. That's always a mouthful for me. Uh, here you're looking at tidal waters influencing the bay. And then you have sediment supply being uh, brought down from those creeks into the marshes. And then you have watersheds yield sediment to the bay. You have um, alluvial fans that form along the back shore of the tidal marshes. Uh, and they, beyond the alluvial fans, you have the finer sediments that are being carried down to the marshes and the mudflats. So fine sediments are stored on flats, resuspended by waves, disturbing the mudflats, and then delivered to marshes by high tide. Marshes are essentially the deltas of local watersheds, and that's an important thing to, to understand about the upper Richardson Bay. If we look at a planned view of the uh, North Bothine Marsh, we can show you one of the, the tidal, the biggest tidal channel in it, and we can show you some zonation that's associated with the different types of sediment sizes. Here you see ab abundant silts and clays and overwash and brooms of the natural levees. You see a, a transition zone that leads to mostly peats out in the, the farther areas from the tidal source, which is that tidal slough that you see in the bottom. Those orange areas are mixtures. If we put a little cross-section there between A and A prime, we can see a high marsh in cross-section. We see natural levees. We see a channel. We see silts and clays at the base of that marsh. And as that marsh developed on a mud flat, it started developing peats at a higher elevation that then grows upward at creeks. On high marshes, the typical elevation a rule of thumb is that that high marsh is at about mean higher high water. So there are three types of sediment types that help form that marsh. There's silts and clays deposited by the tides. There's plant matter that's dropped in situ from roots and debris or, or grows in situ. And there's terrigenous material, various sized inorganic and organic sediment from deltas, fans, and flood deposits. And they all contribute to marsh accretion. One and two are regulated by sea level. That's important. So if we look at the Martian cross-section, higher tides will go above the marsh surface. That's how that marsh forms. It needs those higher high tides, not just mean high water. It needs tides over the surface. The volume of water that flows from the channel and onto the marsh at a given cross-section is called the tidal prism. As the large volume of water drains from the marsh during ebb tide, it maintains the shape, width, and depth of the channel. So what happens to the remaining marsh if part of it is reclaimed? If we put a, a dike in or a levee and fill it uh, with soil to make a development, <laughs> uh, the channel becomes smaller and shallower because you lose tidal prism. And over time, subsidence of levees and fills occurs as marsh peats dry and compact. The elevation of reclaimed tidelands can drop by feet. You see that in the delta, sometimes 30 feet of drowned dropping, sometimes at a rate of inches per year or feet, tens of feet. Eventually, the high tides exceed the height of the subsided levees and flooding occurs at increasing frequency with the reclaimed tidelands. This can also be exacerbated by sea level rise and tectonic downdropping. So we got all those going on. So what about tidal marsh elevations? Marsh elevations range 
from about mean tide, low marsh, to slightly above mean high or high water, high marsh. So the lot happens in a very short distance of elevation. And in that short distance, um, you have zonation of plants. So mean high water, higher high water, excuse me, is about 5.7 feet elevation at Bothine Marsh. Different plant types occur along that tidal gradient and along the salinity gradient. So if we go from left to right, you can see uplands, you see the wetland upland transition zone and high marsh that essentially um, is at the 5.7 foot mean higher high water elevation. It transitions down to middle marsh, which might be gum plants or other types of plants, and to low marsh, and then into mud flats that mean lower low water. So anything that's subtidal is below zero mean lower low water elevation. And that's the important elevation for navigating, because if you're in a boat, you want to know what the elevation of the water is going to be below mean lower low water. Otherwise, you may get stuck during low tide. So let's go back to the landscape context for a moment. Marshes uh, have something that's called progradation. They can build l outward. Uh, that requires sediment for them to prograde. Maintaining backshore elevations above rising tides requires connection to floodplains and alluvial fans. So I seem to be missing a few slides. I'm not sure why that's not working on this program here. In any case, uh, a prograding marsh will evolve from tidal flats, and eroding marshes evolve into tidal flats. The foreshore of a marsh will wax and wane with changes in sediment supply and wave energy. So during sea level rise, marshes migrate landward, and migration requires space sediment supply, and low wave energy. So with sea level rise, we, if we want to maintain marshes, we need to have space for them to go. During riverine floods, marshes provide space for water to spread as it drains to the bay. And when the tide is high at the same time as riverine flooding, backwater flooding occurs in the upland transition zones. So as sea level rises, backwater flooding will move farther and farther back into the landscape. Locations of sediment deposition will also move landward. And predicting where these things will occur, or um, how often it's going to occur, or who's going to be affected by it, those things have not been modeled yet. And it's very site-specific and complex interactions, and we're not there yet. But it's still a concern. How are we going to deal with these things? One last thing, why do marshes matter? Habitat, plants, aquatic species, terrestrial species, birds, they function like filters for sediment and pollutants. They fight global warming by trapping uh, carbon. They buffer shorelines from wave erosion. They attenuate wave runup, and they act like horizontal levees. And aesthetics and recreational values for people all these things and many more that you can probably have your own personal experiences are why marshes matter. So the past has been about men getting more land above water. And I'm going to talk about some historical landscape settings and cause and effect changes now. This is kind of the good part. <laughs> so prior to, to, that should say 1875, that's a last minute addition and I didn't fix that. <laughs> Prior to 1875, at least 5,000 years of Native American settlement existed in the area of, that we now call Marin County. So a little timeline for a minute, this we're going to kind of go back and forth in time. In 1775, first Europeans arrive. 1776, cattle grazing begins and it becomes pervasive. 1781, Richardson Bay is on the map. There it is. And guess what? Maybe even Bothine, what we call Bothine, that area, that Coyote Creek embayment, was also on the map. In 1792, 1840 to 1848, there was cessation of native burning. All these things have an effect on the landscape. 
It's all sorts of other things going on, but I like to list the ones that influence landscape form. 1816, logging begins. 1834, logging intensifies. It was going on right here in Mill Valley, hence the name. 1839, cattle grazing intensifies throughout the Bay Area, but especially in this area too. 1845, homesteading starts along the marshes. And William Richardson in 1845 was one of the first people. There he is. There's this uh, where Coyote Creek historical marsh would be back up in that embayment, right back there behind where his house was. His son Stephen, who was about 87 years old in 1918, said that he would see enough elk, deer, bear, and antelope to fill a good-sized railroad train. There were 19,000 acres comprising what was originally called the Rancho Sausalito for young Stephen to ride through and enjoy. The bay, his father knew it, had waters that not had been, sorry, had waters that had not been fouled by tailings from the mines and were still crystal clear so that a pebble could easily be seen at 30 feet. Can you imagine seeing anything at 30 feet in the bay today? Timber reached in many areas down to the shore, and the stillness was unbroken save for the shrill piping of myriad shorebirds and elk with huge branching horns, graceful antlered stags, and huge grizzly bears stood statuettes on the hillside. So here's uh, Mount Tam that had its logging begin in 1852. Oh, sorry, it started much earlier than that, and it ended, the commercial logging ended in 1852. Here's an 1851 map that I showed earlier. We can see the important things at the time, like El Monte Marsh, the El Monte Bulb. You keep track of that for a while. We see a waveform berm created marsh pans at the back edge of the, the foreshore. We see the historical Coyote Creek Marsh. We see Coyote Creek willow groves back at the back shores of both uh, Coyote and, and uh, the other little valley there at the bottom. So those willow groves were the transition zones of the upland fluvial set water to the back shore of the marsh. We see Coyote Creek. We see Tennessee Creek. We see what was North Manzanita Creek, the Coyote Creek embayment, and this little blue line was the line of mean lower low water. So that's where the, the bay was deeper than the six feet or so between the mean lower low water and the height of the marsh. So the back shore of those marshes is about mean higher high water. This little island, they called it an island, was Silva Island. So now if we look again from an aerial perspective, we see the purple line that represents a, about a 3.4 square mile watershed boundary at the time that went to the, the mouth of the Coyote Creek embayment. Not the embayment, sorry, the, the bay, or the, <laughs> the creek. If we go to an 1868 detail of Sausalito, we can see some important changes that happened from 1851 to 1868. Here's a historical Coyote Creek Marsh, and then we see this yellow line that represents that roads were starting to, to be built along the marsh, the back shore of the marsh, because that's the only way people could travel from place to place was go around those marshes. Going through them was difficult, if not impossible. So San Rafael Road existed along the perimeter of the tidelands. Long travel distances around the marshes were considered an inconvenient. And motivation of the time was to drain the marshes, reclaim and fill the bay, and sell the land. So all those little lots you see extending out there in that, that rectangle were land to be filled in the bay and sold for lots. We can see this, this map that says Tidelands, Marin County, to be sold at public auction on May 18th, 1871 at 10 o'clock. So there was proposed fill not only there in front of the Sausalito shoreline, but also in the upper Richardson Bay. And this is what it would have looked like had they filled all the, the bay that they were going to do. 
And this is what the canal would have looked like that they were going to leave behind that was once part of the bay. This is the proposed Coyote Canal, it was not constructed in the historical marsh, but the lower part of the proposed canal closely aligns with the 1965 flood control channel that now exists along the modern South Bothine Marsh. And that canal above it, this one right in here, this is called the Sausalito Canal. So the proposed railroad that you see with that dashed line that the arrow points to was not built along the alignment that they're showing here, but it was proposed, just like all the land sales were proposed. 1872 comes along, here's the historical Coyote Creek Marsh, land was being reclaimed. Here's about 10 and a half acres that was eliminated. Here's the, uh, the 3.7 acres uh, that were devoted to the shoreline road. Uh, they had to build that on a berm. It's constructed with a bridge over Coyote Creek at the time. And there's the road. So now there's another road to bypass the marsh. Here's 1883. An earlier 1870s North Pacific Coast Railroad trestle existed long before the railroad that we see coming up. But this one was from Strawberry Point to Sausalito. And it was probably on Redwood timber. It must have been hard to maintain because after a while it disappeared. Um, but you can see the railroad went all along Strawberry Point up into toward Corte Madera. And here's the uh, historical Coyote Creek Marsh. Here's the railroad that in 1883 was under construction but not on this map yet. This railroad was being constructed as a trestle as well. And here you can see it, right over there, you can see the historical Coyote Creek Marsh with that linear uh, line going through it. Right here is the railroad. There's the North Manzanita Marsh, El Monte Marsh. There's a slight bulb there that you can see the, the um, Arroyo Corte Madera swinging around. And schooners were anchored at the entrance to the Richardson Bay rather than within it, possibly because it was too shallow even by this point in time. Because all those land use things that I was talking about, those cattle and the logging, those disturb land, they generate sediment, the creeks bring that sediment supply, and we're starting to make a difference in the bathymetry of the bay. There's a new branch to uh, uh, downtown Mill Valley at this time. Note the 1,300 foot long railroad trestle can still be seen across the Coyote Creek embayment. So that railroad trestle was important to understand because it allowed the tides to move back and forth through that embayment up to the marsh and build the marsh. That in trestle was about 1,300 feet long. So uh, here's a picture. This is not uh, South Bothine Embayment here, or Coyote Creek Marsh. Um, it's just to the south of there in Sausalito, but it shows what it looked like when the railroad was changed from a single track to a double track and widened and then put on a berm. And when that berm was built, uh, it was a much shorter distance of a spanning bridge. And so that made a difference in how much tide was available to go up into the South Bothine Marsh area, not South Bothine, into the historical Coyote Creek embayment. So here you see 1898, historical Coyote Creek Marsh is there in the background, and you see this light colored reflectance uh, area might represent water from reservoir or tides, wetlands or an irrigated hayfield at the confluence of Coyote and Tennessee Creek Valleys. Very curious, I'd never been able to quite figure out what was going on there, but maybe water was still getting into that section at that point, or it could have been converted to a freshwater seasonal wetland. Here we are in the library, and here we're gonna focus in and look at what little changes we can detect from this photograph. The detail shows the narrow low tide channel east of the tracks that formed after 1894 when the long spanning trestle that allowed the flow beneath it was changed to an earthen berm and a narrow tidal inlet. 
This had major implications on the rates of sediment and progradation of marsh and embayment. By roughly 1898, uh, we're looking at north of El Monte Marsh along the Mill Valley branch of the Northwest Pacific Railroad that's just beyond the junction of what was the San Rafael branch, the first one uh, formed or constructed. All of the tidal marshlands in this photo are, are influenced by railroad berms that muted the tidal elev that, sorry, <laughs> that muted the tidal prism and caused the channels to lose capacity to transport sediment and therefore decreased in size. So if we go back to 1851 and just do a series of maps and look how it changed, we can see that that, sorry, that was an 1899 map. We can focus in on that and see some details of change. Here's the, the marsh sections that had been eliminated by 1899. We can see where historical Kite Creek is and we can see a number of squiggly lines that represent different sizes of the channel in 1851 is that black wider line. We see an 1892 channel that's in a different position, it's narrower, and we see an 1899 channel that gets narrower yet. So these channel, this channel, Coyote Creek, keeps getting smaller because of the loss of tidal prism over time. Here's the 1851 shoreline. We see 1856 shoreline is prograding into the Coyote Creek embayment. We see the same thing with the later 1899 shoreline. And we also see shallowing of the Richardson Bay. The mean lower low water was quite wide. It's that light blue line that you can see. Then we see that it gets narrower, meaning that the bay is filling in between 1856, 1870. There's very little change, a little bit of change, but it got shallower and it was because marshes were being reclaimed and the tidal prism through that area was not sufficient enough to keep sediment from depositing on the bay itself. By 1900, we're looking southward at the former back shore of the head of the tide of the historical Coyote Creek Marsh. Tamalpais Valley is for sale. Tidal wetlands, you can see off to the, the left side of this picture but you see a possible levee that might coincide with the one that was constructed by 1870 that eliminated the ten and a half acres of marsh. Historical tidal marsh existed down valley of the Spruce Street, but it is interesting to see that this distinct change in slope, you see a very sort of um, darker area right in here, that's a change in the slope from this upland creek valley to the tidal backshore of the marshlands right through here. So this is a transition zone. So it's a distinct change in slope where the alluvial stream leads to the, the tidelands. And you see alluvial valley of Cody Creek, val uh, creek and then you see the approximate location and present day extent of tides that now exist in a concrete channel. This street was called Maine, it's now Laurel, and this one's Poplar, and it used to be called Oak. But otherwise, they pretty much followed through with that design. <coughs> Here's a 1908 Western Railway Museum archives. Just gave me the, this picture. It's nice to get some new things. This one wasn't in the report. It's nice to have actually on the ground pictures because many of the ones I use are aerial. But here you are standing on the hillsides looking out at the the railroad that has the short spanning bridge that's only about 125 feet as opposed to the 1300 foot trestle. And you can see the low tide of the sinuous uh, Coyote Creek over here, but you also see the sinuosity of some of the smaller channels that were draining off the marsh. Here's a 1908 uh, version of uh, a slightly different view and it's interesting to be able to look at this in detail because if we zoom in, we can see abundant remnants of cattle trails to, and shows how intense that area was actually grazed. That was a way to bring in sediment to the marshes and that's one of the reasons we saw increased rates of marsh growth in that Coyote Creek embayment. And also the grass changed and all sorts of other things were going on that increased sediment supply. If you want to learn all about that, look at the report on the web. 
Here's another view. Now, we were busy uh, doing things like bringing in pipes and stuff for construction, but you could also see the runoff effect of grazing because gullies were forming on the landscape. We were seeing some surprises. Here's a long pier that went out to the deep, the <coughs> remaining deep part of the bay, probably to, to supply boats with, with commercial products to San Francisco. And you can also see pipes that are being, being brought in so that they can put probably that gully underground and start developing the hillsides. And here you can see the, the, the shorter spanning bridge of the Coyote Creek embayment. So July 1929, picture of the wildfire on Mount Tam. You can see the smoke coming out. You can imagine it was a pretty horrible thing, but it also brought in a lot of sediment probably to the Arroyo Cordomadera del Presidio, which then eventually made its way down to the bay as well and helped the rate of filling increase. So 1899, we're looking at the, the land that's being removed from marsh status. We're seeing the levee of the, the um, shoreline road. We're seeing the railroad. And we're seeing more tidal marsh reclaimed for development by 1927. And we're seeing bay fill for landing on the Highway 101 Redwood Bridge that's not yet constructed. By this time, more levees had been constructed or to reclaim the marsh, these red lines. And here you see a, a photo version of that. Uh, so if you look here, the drawbridge that was later called Redwood Bridge was opened in 1931. A new levee east of the shoreline road appears. It's near the present day back shore of Bothine Marsh. Do you see this little arrow up here near the left top? <laughs> that little blue arrow is where a Royal Cordomadera del Presidio comes out, and at its mouth, a uh, sediment bar is forming that may have been associated with increased sediment supply from the land use activities or the fire. But that little pink area shows a sediment bar at the mouth of Coyote of um, Arroyo Cordomadera. So here's 1932. We see Almonte Marsh on the left, South Bothine in the middle, historical Coyote Creek Marsh there on the right. And we see the Coyote Creek Tidal uh, uh, Marsh in the turquoise line. The channel has significant sinuosity with its delta fan, which is the yellow area, forming at the channel mouth. So we know there's a healthy sediment supply. The marsh is, marsh is prograding. There's artificial fill over here that's being placed in the bay for highway uh, landing. And on the shoreline road, you can see it's got a pretty good levee on it now. So that back part of the historical Coyote Creek is no longer really functioning well as a tidal marsh. 1946, we see an aerial view of the, the, the tidelands. We see the South Bothine Marsh. We see a Royal Cordomadera. We see reclamation and development already happening in the Mill Valley area. Here's the uh, 1950 view, and we see a change starting to happen in the Arroyo Cordomadera. We see levees and channelization. If we look back at 46, we can see that this channel here did not have a straight channel running through it. So this by 1950 is the beginning of changes that are going to happen in the Arroyo Cordomadera that influence not only Richardson Bay, but later influence the North Bothine Marsh. So here's the straightening of the levee. Expansion of commercial development is going to be happening now. If we're going to go back and look at a different view. Here's the expansion of the commercial area in 1931. It expands in 1946. We see the pink area that's showing a sediment bar at the mouth of the outlet of Coyote Creek beyond the railroad. We see more expansion by 1950. We see residential development at the back shore. 
we see progradation of South Bothine Marsh, which is now a newly forming marsh. Okay, it was not there over 150 years ago. Historical Coyote Creek Marsh shrinks between the levees. And then by 1952, we see even more development. In fact, we see them very busily grading the landscape for the development up in this section. So if you look at this little part here, that's where the creek itself starts to shrink because of the lack of tidal prism. We see residential development starting to happen here, up near the top. We see the progradation of the marsh outward. And Coyote Creek develops sinuosity as, as it builds an alluvial delta through bedload deposition at the back shore and deposition of fine sediments on the marsh. An Almonte bulb up there on the left uh, migrates eastward along the Arroyo Cordomadera del Presidio. The channelization portion of the Arroyo Cordomadera del Presidio west of the railroad tracks is where that little blue thing is. But it hasn't gone <coughs> to the east side of the tracks yet. Nin by 1956, January of 1956, major flooding happens throughout the Bay Area. Some of you were here. I was here. I actually do remember stories about it. Uh, I know that it affected a broad area of the, the landscape. But it also affected plans for the Bay Area throughout the Bay Area because people wanted flood control. Because suddenly all the creeks were misbehaving. And they said, it didn't used to flood here. But what was happening was landscape response to a lot of land use impacts that they didn't understand yet. So the focus was on flood control projects as a priority. Yet, unfortunately, the understanding and appreciation of tidal and riverine hydrology and the effects of land use impacts on the landscape and its ecological environment did not exist at that time. So some projects were avidly pursued, perhaps with the best of intentions, but now some projects might warrant reconsideration. So here we are. This is mid-1956, Richardson Bay. We see dredgers continue to be busy filling the bay. Contain, uh, containment levee offshore of Almonte Marsh was constructed for placement of dredge spoils to continue the plan to fill Richardson Bay. Materials comprising fill and Sausalito were a dumping ground. You can see the, the lower photo is showing you what they're dumping in there, and it truly is everything, including the kitchen sink. So. So new construction was started next to the Redwood Bridge for a bigger concrete bridge over Highway 101. More people, more traffic, better need to convey people quicker. And so that little Redwood Bridge disappeared later on. So, and the need for the drawbridge wasn't needed anymore. The drawbridge was there to fill the bay, and it only opened for the drawbridge because navigation up into the upper part of, of Richardson Bay was history. Nobody needed it, nor could they do it. 1956, a dredge spoil, uh, sorry, dredge spoils containment levy was constructed in a deep part of the bay and not on a marsh. So this is when they really start filling the bay, not just marshes. New dredge spoil deposits, uh, you can see in that dark area, were placed in the containment levee and the canal for Arroyo Cornamadera del Presidio cuts off the bulb at Almonte Marsh. So new concrete for Richardson Bay Bridge, old Redwood Bridge has been demolished, 1960. Continued progradation of South Bothine Marsh is, is still happening though. And you can see this containment levee on the mud, on the mud flats of the bay, sticking out above them. A Royal Cornamadera del Presidio diverted and channelized through the lower part of the bulb of all Monte Marsh. So that nice bend, I'm sorry, is now cut off by a channel that they're cutting through here. And you can see a dredger digging away the marsh and removing it 
to put Phil into the Shelter Bay Cove and to fill, they plan on filling this whole containment levy. So here's the dredger. Here's the dredge spoils that are being placed for Shelter Cove. 1965 is a big year for change. Uh, flood control project diverted and straightened Coyote Creek. Levees were subsequently constructed along the canal banks, disconnecting the upland sediment supply from the marsh. This is a key thing to understand. Coarse bed load was now deposited in the trapezoidal channel stream bed and requires periodic dredging in perpetuity to maintain the project design for flood capacity. Design sediments were now, sorry, finer sediments were now shunted directly to the bay because of the filtering effect of the marsh and plants were eliminated. Artificial fill was placed at the former outlet of Coyote uh, Creek to place a flap gate that would prevent the tides from entering the marsh and embayment but allow rainwater and urban runoff to drain toward the bay at low tide. And about two and a half artificial fill acres of artificial fill and demolition rubble and debris were placed on the marsh to block the canal from being able to access the marsh. A new interior containment cell levy was under construction for dredge spoils. Uh, you can see the dredge in the picture. The outer cell was apparently abandoned. So this was the original outer cell. This became the inner containment cell. 1966, you can see the Sausalito Canal. Remember that old map I showed you that showed the Sausalito Canal? Interior containment levy prevents tides by this time from entering the enclosure, but large amounts of fill are required to raise the land above the bay. The dredge uh, borrow channel for the interior levee is right parallel to the levee, so they dig out mud from the bay and put it on the levee and they make it deeper next to the levee. And they make it so that the dredger can go through there to grab the sediment. The exterior containment levy is offshore from the inner containment levy, but it's still there. And a new levy for future small, what we call rectangle marsh, uh, is uh, starting to be filled in this section. And a former outlet of Coyote Creek flood control channel was here, but now you can see that the flood control channel outlet is here. Here's the, former, here's the former outlet of Coyote Creek filling in with sediment beyond the railroad bridge. It's cut off. And sediment-rich water from Coyote Creek now is being transported directly to the bay rather than the marsh. Here's the boundary of older depositional bar from Coyote Creek before the flood con control channel was cut. I'm going to go to 1973. We can see flood control work fully completed by this time, but a year after this 1973 photo, maintenance dredging was already needed in the Coyote Creek Flood Control Canal. In 1965, the McGeeter Petrus Act and the 1972 federal policies uh, and laws were initiated and regulated filling of the bay. So had that not happened, we probably would have seen that full development out to the, the edge of Richardson Bay with just that Sausalito Canal. So dredging was ongoing, yet then they were prohibited from filling more bay and only did so much. <laughs> so 1973, there's a deep turning basin that was created for the dredge, you can see here. And you can see the exterior levee deteriorated and cut through by the dredge in various places, leaving some isolated remnants not far downstream of the new outlet canal for Arroyo Cordomadera del Presidio. The bulb was cut off, so now there's an entirely new outlet, which is here. Here's the rectangle marsh that was formed from dredge spoils. 1974, we can see levee breaches that occur in the containment levee of North Bothine Marsh. Apparently these were covert, and a side story is that we have a person here who actually kind of let the cat out of the bag and said there was a little 
lady who used to go out at night and cut away at the spoil, at the levee. And that woman was somebody I used to, as a child, go out and hear nature talks. If, you got it. A small, highly disturbed remnant of El Monte Marsh still remains south of the Tam High School athletic field by this 1974 field. It is rarely exposed to the tides, but it's one of the only remnants that hasn't been altered in some way of this study area. Here's a depositional bar shown in pink that expands at the head of the Richardson Bay in the ebb lee of the remnant containment levee that they left. This wasn't intentional, but now it starts trapping sediment and filling the bay at a more rapid rate. Its presence contributes to tidal prism reductions at the head of the bay, and it's ongoing. Here's a 25 foot long bridge. Now, in 1983, the Bay Trail was established, uh, sorry, in 1981, along that railroad grade. It's now a popular spot for biking and hiking or walking, enjoying the, the view of the marsh. But that small inlet limits the tidal prism and its supply of sediment. The marsh continues to be sediment starved since Coyote Creek's sediment supply is disconnected by the canal. So it's getting a little bit of sediment from the bay, not much, its tidal prism is too small, and it's not getting any sediment from the creek. Sediment plume from Arroyo Cordomadera, you can see that white sediment in the water, sediment rich water coming out of Arroyo Cordomadera, and it uh, continues to, sorry, the, the, the bar that I showed you continues to form behind that remnant of a levee filling the bay faster, but it's actually going into that North Bothine Marsh breach. So unintended, but hey, Mill Valley sediment is helping to form a marsh that was breached in a covert fashion, and now we're building marsh there. And it was to be filled by dredge spoils, but it's forming a little bit more naturally because it's being formed by sediment from the tides. The new marsh builds in the embayment north of marsh, uh, of, in the embayment of North Bothine Marsh, and it's nourished by tides. A 1930 levee uh, divides the Al Monte Marsh, which is the historical marsh from North Bothine Marsh. But that Al Monte Marsh isn't in its pristine form anymore because it drowned when that area was eliminated from tides. It had fresh water on it, it subsided. Here's the Al Monte bulb that grows and migrates back in 1952. Now we can see the changes. Here's the flood control activities of 1965 that radically changed the geomorphic and hydrologic processes. El Monte Bald was removed. More dredge spoils are placed by 1973. And El Monte Marsh desiccates and subsides because of the, the lack of tides and just standing fresh water. The deeper enclosed basin uh, that later uh, becomes the boundaries of North Bothine Marsh has standing water and no drainage outlet. And the mixture of brackish and freshwater plants starts to inhabit parts of South Bothine Marsh. So by this time in 1987, both marshes are reconnected again to the tides, yet both have inlets too small relative to the aerial extent of the marshes to supply and distribute sediment to the back shores to evenly maintain upward growth. 2005, we can see a little delta forming at the end of the, the, the low water dredged canal uh, that's impeding on the area of the bay that's below mean lower low water, that little pink area. 2012, we see ongoing sediment deposition in the former dredge borrow channels could future sediment be purposely used to direct uh, to the marshes instead of to the bay? That's the difference. In 2018, we can see 
a difference as well. When we see things like king tides. We see levees uh, in this section over here that it's pointing to that are actually starting to drown. And unfortunately, a picture has gotten out of order and it's showing that the trees that are on that levee are dying because of drowning and subsidence and sea level rise or all the above and we don't know which ones it is yet in particular. We also see uh, the tides come in through the uh, Cody Creek uh, uh, Inlet or sub South Bothine Marsh Inlet and then they also go out during king tides out into the, the canal. So tides are high enough now that they're flowing over the, the subsiding Bay Trail, former railroad levee, and that's an indication that those levees on the canal are not working, but that, that there's going to be a change as more and more water flows out in this direction. Here we can see the influence of the water flowing out of South Bothine Marsh over the, the levee of the canal and into the levee. So those are levees are subsiding. This king tide flowed over parts of the Bay Trail into the South Bothine. And then we had over here this, uh, the, what I just explained about the, the levee. And then over in this little section, I don't know why I can't get rid of that picture. That's unfortunate. We see this little section of the road in along um, Tam High School, and you can see this section right in right in here. It's a place where people can stand and usually not get wet, but that's a king tide that's flooded. And there's a sign that talks about what sea level rise will be by 2100. And you can actually stand there at that sign and you can see how high the water will get. That person happens to be my colleague and husband, Josh Collins. <laughs> and if you're standing there, that's quite a bit of water, five feet. And if you stand at a marsh and you look around and figure out what's going to be underwater, it's pretty disturbing. <laughs> so we see that scientists have come up with some sea level rise estimates for the California, Oregon, Washington areas. And if we just look at California, which is the yellow lines, there's projections for 2030, 2050, and 2100. And we can see on the bottom of this graph the, the f inches and we can see centimeters, inches on top. So by 2030, we're going to be probably at least, this is coast now, not San Francisco Bay, we're going to be maybe nine inches by 2050. It's going to be for California, maybe a foot, 2100. It's going to be maybe for California, looks like about 35 inches. But the range is the length of the bar. The range is big for the coast. And the, and, and the lack of knowing which it's going to be is not clear either. But this graph actually takes into account tectonics and many other things. But the consensus is, in case you didn't know, and I love the dot, 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 because we know who that reminds us of, is that sea level will rise. <laughs> so we have one, I think I went through what the projections are, but what about the San Francisco Bay specifically? And we can go back to that website that I mentioned that gives you a way to model that. By 2050, we have a foot of sea level rise. This is what it would look like. If we project that into the same view that we've been looking at earlier, we can see 2030. If you have sea level rise, you can do different scenarios. If you had a foot of sea level rise in 2030, but you had it happen with a king tide, the total would be two feet. We already know king tides do a lot of flooding already. So the red lines indicate all the levees and infrastructure uh, that's f basically flood controlled that would be inundated and the gray lines are where they aren't inundated. And here's the little sections that, that we already have to deal with that, that are going to affect transportation routes. 
2030, what about one foot sea level rise and a 50 year storm surge? Well, that's even worse. It's only a foot sea level rise, but we have things happen, storm surges, king tides, floods. So that's a much bigger area of flooding, sorry. And then the 2100, that's quite a ways away, but it's not too different than the 2030 with a storm surge. So the future is about staying above water, but where? Sea level rise is just a small component of climate change, yet it has some predictability, whereas local storm patterns and mountain intensity of rainfall, sediment supply, and its distribution are more difficult to predict. Here we can see the, the existing marshes. Here's the five and a half feet projected. Here's the five and a half be projected onto the historical marshlands. It's basically filling where we used to have marshes. No surprise there. So what if we go and look at the, the one foot projected sea level rise and say, wait a minute, something's missing. I don't see any marshes here. Well, what would happen if we had a marsh? Can we change that projection of sea level rise flooding? Can we build marsh instead of take away marsh? Or is it drowning? What can we do? Can we build the back shore up by adding sediment, by doing proactive actions for, for making sure that sediment supply gets there and we can actually direct sediment or bring it in on trucks or, you know, there are lots of ideas. What if we had an alluvial fan there instead, like there used to be, that built the back shore out, that provided sediment to the marsh instead of to the bay? And what if we had channels instead of concrete channels that allowed those creeks that will be having more tidal water in them have floodplains and wider sections that could then help deliver floodwaters, upland floodwaters, to the marsh. So there are a lot of things to think about, but the proximity to the Golden Gate for the Richardson Bay means there'll be no delay in sea level rise effects. You might see a longer delay in that if you're farther away from the Golden Gate. Effects of sea level rise on backwater upstream flooding have not been modeled. And effects of existing water conveyance infrastructure is also not known. So here's that look of how do we deal with the backwater flooding effect. How do we prepare for the future, for the future? <laughs> Make way for the bay or keep the bay away? Pump stormwater over levees or construct creeks that connect sediment to floodplains, alluvial fans, and marshes. Construct subtidal berms to direct water toward marsh inlets, widen the inlets that mute tidal prism and add thin lifts of sediment to build backshore or let the marshes drown. Numerable choices, many decisions. Marshes will fail to survive sea level rise when their sediment delivery is restricted or their tidal prisms are muted by man. And human barriers such as flood walls and levees or natural cliffs prevent marsh migration. And when rates of rise of seed, sorry, when rates of sea level rise far exceed rates of sediment deposition and plant growth. So we have a a view here of the watershed boundary again, the flooding, I mean the sea level rise, and the infrastructure and creek con water conveyance structures throughout the Coyote Creek watershed. This is streams, culverts, concrete, trapezoidal canals, storm drains, pumps, roof drains, roads, gutters, gullies. Got to get that out toward the bay. It's a complicated dendritic sort of mass of water flowing toward the bay. If we look lastly at some of the, the bathymetric maps, one of the interesting things was in the 2018 tidal charts and some of the earlier ones, they started calling that upper, such a, upper Richardson Bay pickleweed inlet. Should we turn all that into a marsh instead of a bay? That's an option. I'm not saying it's a good one, but there are options. So 1851, just a reminder, here's how the bay changed. 
1873, 2005. That's what it looks like today. That little blue area is the deep subtitle. Not really very deep, though. <laughs> it's only about a foot. Okay, so here we have it. The, the marsh as it looked and what it is today. And if we look at the percent remaining, it's only about 26% of marsh and 70% of mudflat and shallow bay compared to what it was in 1851. So land use activities of the past have brought us to the, the present, yet also brought some unintended consequences, some good and some bad, but none planned. I have quite a list of those. Uh, I'll give a few, but not all of them. South Bothine Marsh was an outcome of muted tides caused by the railroad. Reclamation of historical Coyote Creek and Almonte Marshes decreased overall tidal prism, resulting in the loss of deep navigational channels in Upper Richardson Bay. Draining and filling the former marshes with overburden for suburban development led to eventual ground subsidence, increased flooding, and the need for pumping storm water from the backside of the levees to the bay. And remnants of abandoned containment berms trapped sediment from Arroyo Cordomadera del Presidio, leading to increased shallowing of Richardson Bay. Coyote Creek Flood Control Canal disconnected upland sediment supply of, to South Bothine Marsh, leading to decreased rates of marsh growth. Dredging of deep borrow pits adjacent to levees increased their vulnerability to undermining and wave erosion and reduced sediment supply from shallow, gentle, sloping mudflats that generate sediment from wave disturbance to build marsh. Covert breaches and levees of North Bothine Marsh increased its rate of marsh formation from sediment associated with Arroyo Cordomadera del Presidio. So here's the trajectory of acres lost in the cumulative form of all the marshes in the study area. It's in the downhill decline. The, the purple or red line is Coyote Creek Marsh. It's down to zero. None of that is left. The cumulative change in South Bothine has gone up. It started building around 1880s. We see the cumulative change in El Monte Marsh, the historical marsh. There's a little bit left of it, but not much. We see the influence, the little blue arrows are of the years of flooding, and we see all sorts of land use change. But if you see that pink line here, that's when North Bothine Marsh started from the, the dredge spills. And here's the question, which way do we want to go? More or less or more? A community vision of Martian men is required to lead the future to an intentional landscape. And I think your involvement and your word to other people to get involved and plan will be the way to move forward with intentional landscape. So if you want more information, please go to these links. And thank you for attending. And I thank the Mill Valley Library and Marin County Parks and One Tam One for helping put this together tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Sure. been the chairperson for the last 15 years or so and just confirming we are right now in the process of arranging to dredge the concrete channel of Coyote Creek because the Army Corps of Engineers requires us to do it periodically. Um, we are also looking into the possibility of reconnecting the outer part of the channel which doesn't have the concrete walls into the South Bothine Marsh again to allow more interplay between the marsh and Coyote Creek. Um, and just as a reminder, in the six, around the mid-60s, it was proposed by the Army Corps of Engineers that uh, the entire Arroyo Cordobadera del Presidio 
was to be a concrete channel. And fortunately, the city uh, stopped that. The final comment I'd like to make is that the word reclaim and Bureau of Reclamation state phrases like that have always bothered me. It sounds like it was something that was claimed before and lost, and now we're reclaiming it. Um, so is there some way that this presentation could be used without that word? It's very disturbing. You know, I had the, the very same feelings about the word reclaimed. It always bothered me because, like, what, we deserve to have that in the first place? Well, <laughs> apparently they thought so. Uh, but I don't think many of us think like that, but there are still those who do, and in fact, there may be some places that that concept could be applied to make marsh for sea level rise. I wouldn't want to use the word reclaim, though, and I agree with that. And I'm very happy to hear that the flood control uh, is looking at ways to actually change the way that the, the canal works at this point in time, because I think there would be a lot of good reasons that I talked about tonight to, to, to look at that. So thank you for offering that. Yes. Bothine. Now, um, pardon me. Oh, she asked where the name Bothine came from, and uh, you know that's one of the things I've wondered. I know that he was probably a, a, a early resident of the Bay Area. I know that he also was involved in real estate, and we've wondered if maybe he sold or had the land and then sold the land but initially intended it for real estate, you saw that there is certainly real estate plans for that. Now, he's done a number of things around the Bay Area that somebody else here could probably talk far more about than I have because I've often wondered about him and have not taken the time to look up much about his history, but there are many preserves in his name. Has anybody... Is Veronica here? Does she know the name Bothine? There you are. You're hiding. <laughs> okay. So, so Richard Turney, is he still here? He might. Yeah, he was the one who said he may have been a early, had dealings in early real estate. He developed a lot of the Sycamore area. Okay. Do you have a question? Yes. If I understood the drawings correctly, it's uh, we let the sea level rise go where it wanted. It basically would reclaim the area that was March earlier. It would reclaim the developments that <laughs> were March earlier, yes. And so that's why there's obvious concern about how do we want to protect infrastructure or do we want to move people out of the way? But it seems like uh, a losing contest for the March because the people that own that development that occurred on those so-called reclaimed lands have an investment, they're going to be outspoken in wanting to protect it. Um, and they're going to look to government to pay them their loss. Uh, that's a big bill. The, the, it's a big bill to protect them too, so those are going to be the obvious challenges. Um, but before their lands start maybe reducing in value because they are flooding and because flood control may be too expensive to protect everybody, they're going to have trouble getting to their houses. You already have trouble at times going along Shoreline Avenue or parking under Richardson Bridge or crossing the area in front of Tam Valley. How often are people going to say, I can't get to my house, and then they're protecting their real estate value their real estate value becomes questionable. So how do you come together and say, how do we plan for helping to build marsh, helping to protect people? There's got to be some compromises. Our report, our larger report, addresses some of the options that people have for trying to deal with, with areas that flood. And there are people throughout the world now dealing with these issues. So it's it's not just here alone that we have to deal with it. And a lot of people, through history, if you look at the populations of the past, they have to deal with climate change and they move away or they feel that there's a way to adapt and that we need to adapt our communities to the changes that are going to happen, in my opinion. 
So we all want to live here. It's still a great place to live, even if it has higher water. <laughs> There's still livability here. <laughs> Any other questions? Marty? Dr. Marty Griffin here, ladies and gentlemen. I think the battle to save Richardson Bay was about the first big battle to save San Francisco Bay. And uh, Mrs. Livermore and Mrs. Terwilliger sort of led it and uh, was successful. We were able to raise $250,000 to buy out the Bostick brothers. And the Bostics were, he was a pathologist at Marin General and his brother was a, a ecclesiastical student at the church in uh, San Anselmo. So we have some wonderful history here. Well, I'm, I'm glad they came up with the funds. <laughs> Someone else? One last question? Yes? Do I have any comments on the geochemistry? <laughs> there has been uh, work done earlier by, uh, I can't remember her, her name, but she published a paper with the USGS and she did uh, some coring of the marsh sediments. And I believe she found uh, in the places that she cored, and it's different everywhere, but that <coughs> most of them were associated with local sediment supplies. Uh, geochemistry, I don't think she, I'm not really sure yeah, if she was trying to match the rock types, but um, certainly the Sierra would give a signal. And I don't think she was seeing that much of a signal in the Richardson Bay as many of the other marshes. And especially with regard to the, the dredge, uh, or not the dredge, but the hydraulic mining of the Sierra. Yeah, I think that it plays, uh, Second World War um, chemicals flushing up the bay would be of interest. Okay, I have a question. Claire, will you come up here? I'll make it quick. I know folks have been sitting in their seats for a long time. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Claire Mooney. I work with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, and a lot of my work is based in the One Tam Collaborative with Marin County Parks. Um, we just wanted to first thank you all for being here tonight. This is a really exciting crowd for all of us. Tonight's event kicks off a number of events that we're having into September and into the fall um, to really look at Bothine Marsh and to speak with all of you more about the site. Uh, Marin County Parks, through One Tam with support from the Parks Conservancy, is currently working to develop a community vision for what near-term protection of both Ian Marsh looks like, as well as what long-term adaptation looks like. Um, and the events in the fall we're really using as an opportunity to meet folks in the community, to meet users of the site, and to understand why it's important. How does it fit into your community? How is it part of your everyday? How does it really create a sense of place for those of you that live or recreate or bike through that area? Um, we have a number of things up here at the table that we'd love for you guys to grab on your way out tonight so that we can see you again. Uh, we have postcards that lift events like kayak trips, bike Bike trips. We're going to be actually out at the Mill Valley Community Center this Sunday doing a family event. So if you guys want to bring the kids or the grandkids, we're going to be doing a scavenger hunt. We'll have our roving ranger out. We'll be having scientists out and waiters to answer questions. Um, so it will be the, <laughs> the great, dramatically dumbed down version of what Laurel did tonight. <laughs> um, but still worthwhile. Um, and for m folks that want to stay involved in a longer loop, we do have an email list here. We do have a website up, so you can visit onetam.org for more information. Um, and we'll be continuing to host events, talks, and more as we really look to develop this community vision. And again, the focus of our conversations right now are really on you know, how is Bothine part of your world and part of your community here in Marin? So if you do have a minute on your way out, maybe leave some thoughts on what we're calling our accretion board. We want to kind of use these ideas to build up a new future for Bothine Marsh. So thank you all again for coming tonight. Thank you so much to Deborah and co for hosting. This has been, again, a great way to kick off this fall events for us. And remember, what we're deciding today is going to be the future history talks of tomorrow. 
Okay, well, I, before we go, I just want to make a couple of announcements that um, we look forward to seeing you for our next first Wednesday in October. Uh, we're going to have uh, the Mill Valley's Golden Age of Rock and Roll with music historian Richie Unberger. And I scheduled him because we have a legendary musician, Marty Ballin, who's going to be receiving the Millie Award in October. So I thought we might get warmed up with that rock and roll history talk. But also on October 20th, the Mill Valley Historical Society has partnered with the Throckmorton Theater, and I'll be hosting a onstage live interview with Marty Ballin. And there'll be some musical surprises, so hopefully we'll see you at the Throckmorton on the 20th. And finally, back to this conversation, One Tam has curated an exhibition chronicling environmental history, landscape change, and preservation efforts at Bothine Marsh, Evolving Shorelines, a historical view of Bothine Marsh, which is now on display upstairs in the library's gallery space, which is not quite to the top, but on the way. So check it out if you have a chance. And next Tuesday, September 11th, there will be a reception event for this exhibition. The reception will take place from 5.30 to 7.30, with wine and cheese will be served. And finally, I just want to say special thanks to our two of our attendees today, Huey Johnson and Dr. Martin Griffin, our rebels with the cause who have done so much for our community and for our land and preserving so much of the beauty that we all enjoy today. Thank you all for being here tonight, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month.